Well, welcome to lunch, everybody. My name is Bill Well, and we're happy to have you here. Um, we're uh, Matt Welch from Reasons Magazine, and I are going to do a little Q and A later. I've, I've been making a uh, informal tour of uh, Libertarian Party state conventions uh, the last few weeks, starting in Texas and then in uh, New York, and then uh, here yesterday and today, and next week is uh, Indiana, I think, and it's been very enjoyable for me to get out and uh, touch and feel. I, I, I can almost feel myself getting sinking more deeply into uh, the Libertarian Party, and uh, uh, as far as, I don't know how many of you heard Nick Sarwark this morning, but he said that the, the um, the, the vertical and horizontal that really makes a difference is not are you over here on the doctrinal spectrum, but are you a nice person or a, since there were children in the room, he said jerk. <laughs> and it's all of all nice people as far as as far as I can see. And, and I've, learned, I've learned a lot since uh, 2016. I mean, I, I do blush to think of some of my early steps since I was called by Garrett Johnson eight days before the the convention, so I didn't have a lot of time to uh, uh, bone up, as it were. But I can remember saying at that convention, "Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm really a Second Amendment guy because uh, I'm I'm a hunter and I own shotguns and rifles." And that's not really the point. Uh, as I said last night, the point was driven home to me when I went out to uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, at the end of the 16 campaign. Uh, it's a little town, and I got I bought this uh, fantastic uh, sweatshirt with a picture of Geronimo, the Indian chief, on the front. And he's holding a rifle over his head like this, uh, saying, uh, uh, "Turn in your weapons." So he's illustrating how they would turn in a rifle, and he's grinning. And at the bottom it says, "The government will protect you." Well, you know, within months they've laid down all their arms, and they were enslaved to the United States government and deprived of everything, and basically lived in captivity for generations and generations uh, forever thereafter, and there are a number of other examples in history of peoples who have been persuaded to lay down their arms, and exactly the same thing has happened. So that's uh, perhaps an example of having uh, me setting more, uh, settling more deeply into issues that are uh, of interest uh, to this uh, uh, to this uh, group, and I've read pretty widely in the literature. I had started in law school with John Stuart Mill on liberty and uh, Friedrich Hayek, and my favorite being not even the road to serfdom, but uh, the Constitution of Liberty. Wrote a paper in law school against the idea of progressive taxation. Pretty much a takeoff of a chapter in the Constitution of Liberty. The first words of which chapter, uh, which was about the same thing, we should not have graduated income taxes. And, and Hayek's first sentence in the chapter is something pretty close to, in many ways I wish the present chapter could be omitted. <laughs> it would be not well, uh, not well received. But uh, I've always been in politics kind of a happy warrior and uh, never more so than now. And, and my wife Leslie is uh, joining me. Uh, and she got pretty good into the 16 campaign, and towards the, the end of the campaign, she introduced me and Gary at our rallies, which were kind of a high point of the campaign. Wonderful energy <clears throat> and wonderful spirit. So I think, as I said last night, it's all good, and things really are uh, coming our way, and if everybody does their job, we're going to have some of these breakthrough moments. It would be very nice if Senator Epi in uh, Nebraska to get uh, re-elected, because that would be assigned to other uh, candidates. Uh, it'd be very nice if uh, Larry Sharp uh, and or Dan Fishman in New York and, and uh, Massachusetts, respectively, uh, could finish uh, first or second in their races for uh, governor and state auditor, respectively. And I think they're going to beat the Republicans in both those states, and that's going to be a national story, because the national press is hungering to be able to write the story that the third parties are coming and these calcified R&D parties in Washington are now going to break up. And, and I think that's a true fact. Uh, I spent a lot of time predicting the split up of the Republican Party 
uh, in 16 uh, on the analogy of the Whigs in 1854 to 1856, and maybe Matt Welch and I will get into that in a little bit. But I do think, as I said last night, that both the parties, uh, the R and the D party, both the calcified parties, are splitting in half right now. They just don't know it yet. And, uh, you know, the 2020 election is still two years away, so there's plenty of time for those fissures to become uh, become visible and, and deepen and widen even further. So I think the future looks very, very good for the folks in this room, and thank you for coming, and I now submit myself to the authority uh, of my uh, my uh, cross-examiner, uh, Matt Lund. Always remember to respect <coughs> the authority. Um, <laughs> hopefully you have enough uh, time uh, left over to have all of your uh, hostile questions. Well, I'll get a few of my, uh, my own in here, and I'm kidding about that. But um, when I was first telling people, and including some people in this room, that we're going to have this conversation, uh, probably the most common response reaction was, what's he doing? There. <laughs> um, there's a lot of spirit behind that, which we'll get into later in the conversation. But I actually wanted to ask you that as a very kind of practical question. What are you doing um, here? And also specifically, what are you doing with your activities these days? There's been endorsements. I believe there's a 501c4 percolating or already a form. What are you doing in the Libertarian Party space right now? I'm doing what I always do, which is I'm having fun. Uh, I enjoy going around to these weekends. It's better than, you know, sitting at home pretending to, to read a book. It's, it's lots of fun. I feel myself broadening and, as I say, even deepening politically. I've always taken my politics very seriously, uh, and so I don't joke around about it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a happy warrior, and I enjoy it, which is why I run so often for so many things, <laughs> not too many of which I win. I got the two good victories for governor, but my batting average is still lower than Ted Williams' batting average of 406 in 1941. I never forget that. But that's, that's A. Uh, technically, uh, what, what I'm doing is trying to articulate to people, and I really have been doing a lot of reading and thinking about what it means to be the Libertarian Party and what the, what the possible you know, achievements and upsides for the Libertarian Party uh, could be. Uh, trying to articulate to the party what I think the party needs to do, and Adam Kokesh and I discussed this in, in Texas, what the party needs to do to get ready for 2020. And I think both Adam and I think that it doesn't have to be us to carry the flag across the finish line, but there are things that's important for the party to do. And, uh, you know, I, I said last night there's a couple of practical things the party needs to do. Uh, it needs to concentrate on that presidential race, be serious about it, uh, you know, and have in mind that we can win. As, as uh, there's a Republican uh, consultant wrote a piece in the Sunday New York Times magazine a couple months ago where she pointed out, and I think this is correct, that the odds of a third party winning the election, the presidential election of 2020 are at least as good as the odds of Donald Trump winning the presidency were two years before his election for president. Trump could have gotten a thousand to one odds. Uh, you know, a third party winning in 2020, I don't think the bookmakers would give you much more than 50 to one odds. On, uh, on that, and you know, a lot of people, myself included, have started at under two percent in the polls, which would be 100 divided by 50, and won the race. My first race was for attorney general in Massachusetts when I was 32 years old. I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nobody. I got 20 percent of the vote. People said to me, "Oh, we didn't know Massachusetts was a multi-party state," and I would say, "Well, actually, it's not. That was a two-man race." at which point they would turn ashen and the conversation would stop. But next time out, uh, I won the governorship. 50.01% of the vote, because the Democratic Same Party... Same percentage you won vice president of the Libertarian Party. <laughs> <laughs> that was 50.02. Not that we're counting. <laughs> Um, you talked a lot of just right now, and then also last night, in terms of 2020 presidential race. That seems to be your focus. So the obvious question is, are you considering running for president in 2020? I'm proud to run for VP in 2016. Uh, I have a lot of different things I'm doing now. I'm a member of a law firm. I'm a member of a 
business consulting firm, I'm on corporate boards, uh, I travel a lot internationally, I'm a member of a society of former world leaders that meets all around the world considering the great issues that confront countries other than the United States. The big four are number one, water, number two, food, number three, nuclear non-proliferation, and number four, religious sectarianism, which is no longer Northern Ireland. Now it's a straight proxy for Sunni Shia. Uh, but so I spend a lot of time in the international area, and, and Rosie and I have what I would call a full life of tons of travel. Uh, but you know, I take this stuff seriously, as I said. Uh, and, but I'm sincere when I say that I'm not talking about who is going to do uh, the libertarian race in 2020. I'm just here to say that I think that's a race that has some real potential to go the distance, and the sooner we all wrap our minds around that, the better. Are you out there uh, recruiting potential candidates, personalities, people who are not yet libertarians, but are libertarian leaning and should be? What, what are you out there? What kind of conversation? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm certainly focused on the candidates who are running now, and we have this mechanism for endorsing uh, candidates, libertarian candidates, who are already uh, out there. Laura Epke, I think, was our first uh, endorsee. We had a round of eight a few weeks ago. We'll be having another round of eight, then another round of eight, and I met with a couple people uh, here who I think are going to be uh, in the next round, uh, particularly where their election schedule kind of commands that, that they get that. We will not go into primaries where there are two libertarian candidates, but if it's not a libertarian primary, then uh, you know any, anybody's uh, uh, welcome to be considered for that. So, so that's at that level. Uh, I'd be lying if I didn't admit that. I'm looking also at the national level for people who could be helpful to the Libertarian Party. And there are two types. One is people who are office holders or have been office holders in the R and the D party, but who really are libertarians underneath it all. Uh, another is billionaires who could fund the operation. Because we can't afford to be caught short, as Gary and I were last time, when Gary was at 13% shortly before the decision on the presidential debate. He was at 39% among millennials who were going to inherit the kingdom. And that was just too much for the R party and the D party. So tens of millions of dollars of negative advertising just descended on our heads to help the, the so-called presidential debate commission make their learned decision as to, you know, <clears throat> what would most please their two keepers, the R party and the D party. And we went from 13 to 5 in a week or 10 days because we, we didn't have the wherewithal to respond. You can't be dark against, uh, against that amount of advertising for a week or 10 days without plunging the polls. So I think we have to have at least $50 million, if not $100 million, <coughs> starting off uh, next time for the national ticket. We want to be well, much better funded at the state level, too, and I'm trying to do a little bit uh, there for, for various races, but that's just a mechanical thing we have to focus on, and there are plenty of billionaires in the United States who self-identify as libertarians, small L libertarians. I'm talking to that class of people as well. Um, during the campaign, you know, uh, and during they were fond of uh, using some formulation of the phrase that there's a six-lane highway in the center of the road or the political spectrum. There's a sort of a casting of libertarianism as a centrist idea. I think that Josh M. Gray mentioned this in, in his uh, keynote out there. I hear some pushback from that um, among uh, people in the room. I am sort of squishy, so I would uh, sound, I, I feel inherently more centrist than the average person in this room. But the problem with centrism, or one of critique of it, let's say, that I'd like you to address, is that, is that not defining yourself by where the other guys are? Um, and so, if the other guy's moving this way, well, okay, yeah, our center of gravity is over here. It feels <coughs> less a statement of identity and ideology and more positioning. Yeah, no, it, it's no longer, the six lane highway is no longer how I open the conversation. Uh, I do think it was true, Gary used to stress it, but it is just talking about ideology, and I think the real argument for the Libertarian Party is deeper than that. It's that the two monopoly parties at the national level, certainly, have become totally 
calcified. Uh, the Republican Party began in the mid-1850s uh, uh, in dynamism, and it's ended in orthodoxy. And that's a picture of an organization, an institution, that is crumbled. Uh, so, you know, the fact that the two parties in Washington are locked in a spiral death embrace and exist for no purpose, really, other than trying to kill the other party, but even more deeply than that, to get reelected. And it's kind of a mind theater. They pretend to hate the other party more than anything else, but what they're really doing is trying to stoke up their base to get more money to support their campaign so that they can get reelected. And the hyper gerrymand gerrymandering that has gone on for decades pretty much ensures that if you're a D in Congress, you're much more susceptible to a challenge from the left in the primary than you are to a challenge in the general because your district has been gerrymandered to make it a safe D district. Ditto, Matthias Matandis, you know, uh, for the Republicans, you, your, your danger is really getting outflanked uh, on the right uh, in a primary. And, and that's just a recipe for never coming together on anything that might be the best thing for the people. Having said all that, I don't, uh, you know, retreat from the idea that we are different being fiscally conservative, as all of us indubitably are, and, uh, and socially welcoming, tolerant, not jerks, not exclusionary. Uh, my favorite definition of a good democracy is one where the individual shall not be thrust in a corner. And I think that defines the Libertarian Party. I don't think it defines the administration we have in Washington today which seems to delight in thrusting individuals and groups of individuals into a corner. There's, I don't know if you ever used this word, but it's used uh, about you, and I think it describes you at least somewhat temperamentally, and that would be moderate, at least uh, compared to uh, uh, some of us weird people out there. You kind of, you can take you home to mom, in theory. Uh, as long as you know, Peter Jack Daniels and et cetera. But, um, no, that, uh, and that was a, you and Gary Johnson were competent. You're actually the only qualified ticket kind of running on some level uh, in the election um, in all things moderation of a point someone was making to me recently, and I think we see it out there in the uh, polity at large, particularly in my field in the opinion journals. <clears throat> conservatives become anti-Trump conservatives, um, which uh, I think most of the best ones are. They realize that they don't have any readers left, and uh, uh, everyone hates moderates, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, it, we feel like we're in a political moment where it's passion and authenticity and an emotional connection that might be pre-political or anti-political or side-political there. Um, respond to that. Well, I appear moderate, but that's stylistic, and I think it's quite shallow, uh, superficial. Uh, if you look at what I did in office, uh, I was the most fiscally conservative governor in the United States. I cut taxes 21 times in a row and never raised them. I cut spending in real terms uh, year after year. I abolished cabinet uh, agencies. Couldn't have been more fiscally conservative. So that's not a moderate on fiscal policy. On social policy, I was a complete whack job. I mean, I was out there on gay and lesbian, full civil rights, marriage, etc., 15 years before anybody else. I endorsed, uh, this is 1991, my first year in office. I appointed uh, a whole bunch of uh, gays and lesbians, judges and cabinet members. I married two of my uh, cabinet members, a man who was head of uh, uh, the uh, taxation department and the man who was my chief of staff. So that got people's attention. Uh, I, without thinking it was at all important, uh, came out strongly for uh, medicinal marijuana in 1991 or 1992 for treat of, uh, nausea, treatment of nausea from chemotherapy and, uh, and glaucoma, because those are two regimes where the, there had been enough research done so that we knew that uh, the cannabis was effective there. Now, thanks to the fact that research uh, in Israel is legal on marijuana. We know that <clears throat> it uh, ca cannabinoids, notably uh, CBD, which is not the THC ingredient, but the one with no negative side effects whatsoever, go directly to alleviate pain, uh, anxiety, insomnia, sort of soft diseases, and address symptoms of the big horrible diseases, cancer, hepatitis, diabetes, uh, Parkinson's, uh, uh, epilepsy, seizures, and again, there are regimes that have been conducted chemical research at the state level 
that show that if you take a child with epilepsy who's having 60 seizures a day and you expose them to cannabis, pretty soon they're having one seizure a month. And I have a niece who has this condition, so it's not you know, academic to me. Uh, I lost a godson to opioids, one glass of wine, one pill, a wrong pill, dead. Uh, and you know, that's, uh, that leads me to another area where I'm not a moderate, which is uh, the uh, opioid crisis and, and what the hell we're supposed to do about drugs. And I think we need to, and uh, the story that, uh, that Nick uh, told this morning about the woman who had been uh, incarcerated for 25 years in Louisiana for having 0.7 grams of uh, crack cocaine on her because she's had, uh, she had had adverse sexual experience and, and, and took it for the pain. So she served 19 years in prison. I mean, what is that, what is that doing? So I gave a speech at the National Mall maybe four years ago uh, saying we got to stop treating addiction, whether it's alcohol addiction or narcotics addiction, as a fit subject for criminal investigation and prosecution and treat it as the public health emergency that it is. I recently, a couple of weeks ago, went on the board of a cannabis company in New York together with my admittedly old friend, John Boehner, who was Speaker of the House as a Republican and who declared in 2011 that he was unalterably opposed to the legalization of marijuana at any time for any reason under any set of circumstances. So we both hit the TV in New York pretty good two weeks ago. We got one billion eyeballs, that's three for every man, woman, and child in the United States in one week of television. Nobody was particularly interested in me because I had been for medical marijuana for, you know, umpty ump years. And, and in fact, that kept me from going to Mexico, it may have saved my life. Uh, uh, Jesse Helms used as an excuse to paint me as salt on drugs, and so I don't care where Mr. Wolf goes as long as it isn't Mexico, boo-hoo-hoo, <laughs> But it may have been all for the best. Anyhow, I, I don't think of myself as a moderate uh, at all. I think of myself as an extreme on both uh, fiscal policy and social policy. It's just a different extreme, that's all. Another um, issue that you told me when we talked in November, I think it was, that exposure to uh, this group has changed you a little bit, um, at least, is on the question of military interventionism. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, at the end of the campaign last year, people were asking, what about the 80,000 troops in, uh, in Afghanistan? And, and Gary and I both said, you, if, if they're not going to come home now, when are they going to come home? And the answer very clearly was never. <laughs> Uh, because there would never be a time when you couldn't make the argument that if we don't bring the troops home, why the Taliban is going to take over and terrible things are going to happen and we'll have blood and rape on our hands. And I was pretty close to the Bush White House, just because of mutual friends, when they went into Iraq in February of 2003 and familiar with the thinking in the White House. And it was a whole bunch of neocons, many of whom were friends of mine, sitting around telling increasingly hair-raising stories about things that Saddam Hussein and his two sons would do. There were rape rooms in the palace where rape was countenanced and encouraged. Uh, Saddam's two sons would take sticks and break the knees of members of the Iraqi national soccer team when they didn't uh, you know, perform well in a tournament. And you could just see the blood rising and the level of the heads of senior people in the White House. And what a hell of a reason to uh, invade another country. So like I said last night, uh, we got to, if not extirpate the phrase regime change from the vocabulary of the English language. We can't have it be the court of first resort when an administration in Washington reads in the newspaper something about, it's so terrible what they're doing here. In these African countries, there's genital mutilation of females, even when it's against their will. So we should invade 26 African countries. You know, but, but that is how people think in Washington, D.C. And it may be just, I'm going to show you that you know, I've got more, I've got a bigger one than anybody else, because I'm going to go invade this goddamn country where they're not nice to women or they, something else that we don't like. They're Karl Marx on steroids. Let's invade. So yeah, no, I'm much more uh, 
with the program on the anti-intervention. In fact, I think what we do is often worse than mere intervention. It's it's hurrying to regime change, which is not right. <coughs> One week before the election, one of the reasons why some libertarians still have get goosebumps when you're in the room. Uh, you went on Rachel Maddow. Yeah, those aren't goosebumps. That's hives. I was <laughs> right. <laughs> Euphemistic sometimes. Um, you went on Rachel Maddow, and you were there to vouch for uh, your old friend Hillary Clinton. Some people pointed out that you were running as vice president of a political party that was campaigning against Hillary Clinton, and so thought that maybe that wasn't the best thing in the world for you to do at that time. Um, any regrets, and what were you doing? Well, I, I picked the word vouch, not the word endorse, because it was a personal statement. And, you know, I'd known her when we were both in our 20s. I thought she was a, a good kid, uh, and people really were dumping hot oil all over her, and the campaign had gotten quite unpleasant. And, by the way, no one in the United States was sticking up for her at all. I know they ran a terrible campaign. I know it was arrogant, but nobody said a word positive about Hillary Clinton, who's not a fiend. I mean, I've known her for a long time. So what I, what I said on Maddow, I think, was I wish somebody besides Donald Brazel and the members of the Democratic National Committee would, you know, vouch for Hillary Clinton as a person. Uh, and so I did, and I chose the word vouch, and uh, I believe uh, it's fair to say that I insisted until Election Day, and on Election Day, no, 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 do not vote for our party. Uh, vote for the, uh, do not vote for the Democratic Party. Vote for our party. We need to get our 5%. It's, uh, it's institutionally important. <clears throat> I, I, did, I did express uh, the fact that I thought that she was maybe more uh, palatable than, than the Republican candidate, uh, who might... Uh, compared to certain figures in uh, Germany in the 1930s and 40s, and never saw anything during the campaign to make me see fit to change my opinion there. Uh, there was some discussion, uh, Nick, Nick talked about hate uh, in uh, his remarks this morning. He said it's tough for humans to sustain hate. And, you know, on Morning Joe, uh, a few weeks after uh, Gary's experience with them, I went on and read a couple pages from 1984, the George Orwell novel, and it's uh, Big Brother, and everyone has a TV screen that they have to look at all the time in their apartments, how Big Brother maintains uh, his control. And every afternoon there would be two minute hate, and Big Brother would get on the TV screen. You had to look, uh, or you would get zip feeling in your neck, uh, and it would beam hate for two minutes. So he would fill everyone with hatred. And at the end of it, people were just exhausted. They knew they hated somebody or something, but they weren't quite sure what it was, but they really hated it. That was Nazi Germany. Uh, and I had too much of that, to be, and by the way, uh, 1984 became a huge bestseller right after uh, President Trump was elected in the United States and Europe. Um, so that all fed into uh, why I said, you know, I vouched for Hillary Clinton. Uh, question, weren't you outraged by uh, her email, all the stuff about her emails, shouldn't she have been locked up and hauled off to prison? Uh, partial answer, you know, I was in the Justice Department. Uh, I had tippy-top secret clearance. Uh, and I frankly thought that the classification of information as being secret, top secret, and beyond was somewhat overdone. Uh, if something was politically embarrassing or would make the people who were doing the government activity look stupid if published on page one of the newspaper, boom, it's secret. If it would make them look really stupid, boom, boom, it's top secret. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I was very familiar with the classification system and how uh, really pablum-like a lot of the material classified as secret. Is. So, so that's also in the back of my head. I, I didn't say that at the time. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've said that. But that also probably figured into my general attitude towards the Democratic candidate. Nick uh, Sorok also said this morning, and sort of a light admonition to people not <coughs> to um, necessarily hate the new person who walks through the front door, uh, kind of tardily to the uh, Libertarian uh, Party and, and tell them to go away. Uh, how has your experience been 
with the uh, with the Libertarian Party. Um, do, do you feel like you're on the receiving end of a, of, of a two minute hate? Uh, are you enjoying yourself? How's that process? No, I'm enjoying myself hugely, and it's not without you know serious conversations that uh, dredge up of past activities. I had a very sort of moving conversation with a couple of highly intelligent, respectful people uh, the evening after the New York uh, uh, convention. Uh, it was at Larry Sharp's uh, kickoff dinner before the proceedings began. And they said, well, talk to us about a couple of things. Uh, you were running for governor of New York uh, in uh, 2006, and uh, you had the Libertarian Party nomination. You were looking for Republican, liberal, libertarian. But then you lost the Republican convention because everyone who told you they would support you, not everyone, but a lot of them uh, double-crossed you at the end, so you came up way short, 60-something to 30-something at the convention. And you kind of left town. Uh, and that kind of left us having to get another candidate. I didn't leave town as late as Andrew Cuomo had done because it was time to get another candidate. But that actually did not factor. What factored was that I was so furious at the New York Republican Party for essentially being corrupt, and I had an up close and personal view of the process there, and it was corrupt. George Pataki was not corrupt, but the party itself had become corrupt during three terms of uh, unchallenged Republican rule of the state. Uh, we were at the party the night before, and uh, the wife of one of the major uh, figures in, in the state party came up to Leslie and said, you tell your husband to stop talking about cleaning everything up. I've been waiting 22 years to get mine, meaning patronage, and it's my turn now, and you just tell your husband to shut up and go away. She spoke for many uh, at that convention, and I had, you know, cut my teeth as a corruption prosecutor in Boston. I convicted 110 out of 111 defendants in public corruption cases, uh, virtually all of them not just theft of honest services, but taking money from the public treasury. Because I've seen it go on in a one-party state, Massachusetts, for decades. No-show jobs. That's theft from the public. But it was a way of life in Boston. So anyway, that had been my animus coming into, uh, into public life. And to see this and to uh, become a victim of what I thought was a thoroughly corrupt uh, process I took the family and, you know, we went off to France for several weeks for me to get my head straight. Would it be better if I made the rounds of the Libertarian Party and told them everything I've just said and said, by the way, I'm sorry, and I know this is not good for you, and it's early enough, so I hope you'll be able to get, you know, a, a, a presentable candidate and not be too prejudiced in the fall? Yeah, it would have been much better. But, but that's one I do regret. I don't regret so much saying I vouch for Hillary because everyone's jumping up and down on her, but I do regret that one. Uh, and another one I do regret, again, this has not come to public view before, but uh, somehow I became persuaded during that New York race that, that I should seek the backing of the conservative party. Uh, and the conservative party and I have virtually nothing in common in, in New York except for anti-tax. Know, way social conservative. So I said, I'm proud to have appointed the woman that wrote the opinion holding uh, gay and lesbian marriage constitutionally required, both as a matter of equal protection and the due process clause. <clears throat> but in this race in New York, uh, I'm just going to uh, take a little bit of time to study whether uh, it fits in with, uh, I don't know, the cosmogony, the thinking in New York. Is New York ready for this, etc. I'm ashamed of that. And that was just a couple of sentences speaking to the Conservative Party. But if I was speaking to the Liberal Party or the Libertarian Party, would I have said that? No. So that's probably the single sentence I'm most ashamed of. Um, last night, I think it was, Jim Gray said that uh, the, the world of public America is much more libertarian than as showing up necessarily in the vote totals. And he laid that down in large part to not the way the Libertarian Party is, but the way the Libertarian Party is perceived by the public. Do you agree with the assessment that there's a perception problem with the Libertarian Party and the public? And if so, what are they perceiving and what is the problem and how can we fix it? Well, you know, I think a lot of people, particularly senior generations, think Libertarian means Libertine and they don't move 
past that. I, I think the problem probably is fear of the unknown, and as the party becomes better known, people are going to note the, the absence of horns. Uh, but it's also it's the flip side of the hold that the R party and the D party have over people. Uh, at one of the conventions, I, I quoted Clinton Rossiter, who wrote a book called The American Presidency. And he said, well, what is a political party? A political party is a vast, gaudy, friendly umbrella that can be loved and trusted at succeeding elections and, uh, and recognized uh, at successful elections as being the same thing that was loved and trusted before. In other words, it's a security blanket, and you have to vote R or D because your mammy and your pappy did, uh, or because the other side will run us into, run us into ruin. Uh, but that, that's not really a logical thing, that you have to do something because of your security blanket. And as the issues get out there and get vetted, I do think 50 or 60 percent of people in the United States are libertarians. If you, if you do define it uh, uh, doctrinally as being uh, fiscally conservative, caring about property rights, and yet also not wanting the government in your bedroom. I do think that's 50, 60 percent. There's a lot of polling to that effect. But people just don't get to ask the question, uh, don't get the question asked that would produce that answer. As Gary said, if the question had been, who do you like, Trump, Clinton, or Gary Johnson? Gary Johnson would have been at 20, 25 percent the first time that question was asked. It was never asked. It was never asked. So our opponents assume their own conclusion and bootstrap their argument. By our opponents, I mean the adherents, the blind adherents of the R party and the D party who adhere to those parties for the wrong reasons. Uh, I'll ask just a couple more, and I hope we have time for questions afterwards. I don't know if anyone's keeping that clock uh, uh, handy. Um, I won't pretend to uh, characterize different shoots and factions within the Libertarian Party, because y'all start throwing stuff at me, um, but if we presume that there is a uh, pragmatic caucus, and we presume that there's a radical caucus, and I think there may be both of those things, um, you would probably be on the more pragmatic side. So uh, a question is, what is your message to our radical friends in the Libertarian Party and your relationship with them? So pragmatic, uh, I don't think is a great word. It's kind of like moderate. Uh, when I was uh, you know, carrying the banner for pro-choice at the convention, trying to get a floor fight at the Houston convention on, uh, on the abortion question to kind of publicize it and show that the Republican Party was a big tent, Everyone laughed at me, and I said, well, why? I've got Jock McKern of Maine, I've got me, all I need is four more, and there are 16 Republican governors here, why, why can't we get six? Of course, four or five. And they said, because moderates always cave. Uh, and it, it's quite true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, pragmatists, I'm not sure that's a great word either. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to say that I can't be an anarchist if I want to in service of a good cause. I do have one mean thing to say about anarchists, and I said it all the time during the 2016 campaign. I said, well, Proudhon, the French anarchist, said that property is theft. He didn't think anyone should have private property as a Marxist uh, because uh, it should all be held in common. I, Billy Well, have never thought that. I've always held that coercive taxation is theft. And by the way, I said this throughout my campaigns in Massachusetts and New York. So, I then conclude, it just goes to show you that even anarchists aren't always right. <laughs> <laughs> just give them a tickle. Uh, final question, and I'll hand it over, is uh, what has Donald Trump taught us about American politics and persuasion? and about uh, the, the American public. Well, I mean, I think he's taught us a lot. Uh, he's, by the way, a skillful person, an intelligent person. I think he's kind of like an idiot savant. He can, <laughs> he'll surprise you, he'll surprise you. I mean, these thrusts and powers and energy that he shows in the foreign policy front, he, he may get lucky and, uh, uh, you know, really score on uh, Korea and some, some other areas. I think the coolest thing he's done is when he was talking to Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago. And he said, look, I really need some help on Korea dealing with this guy there. Uh, and I, I'd like your help on the economic front to let them know that they're not going to have a free ticket economically. And if you want to help me, we can do some great stuff on trade. It'd be really fun. 
But if you don't want to help me, that's okay. I'll do it myself. And she came in and said, well, I'll think about it. So five minutes later, a general comes in and whispers, a stage whisper in the president's ear, locked and loaded. So the president looks at him and says, well, I told you yesterday, go ahead, launch. I mean, what do you think? I'm a moron or something? I forgot what I said yesterday. And the general leaves the room. Comes back 15 minutes later, the target is destroyed, sir. So the president turns to Xi Jinping, who does not speak very good English at all, uh, and says, you know what I just did? To an interpreter. No. He says, I just fired 59 cruise missiles and wiped out that air base in Syria that just dumped all those chemicals on those kids in Syria yesterday and killed them all. You saw Nikki Haley's speech in the UN. And Xi Jinping says, what? And makes him repeat it all through the interpreter. Then he goes and looks out the window at a source who's in the room. Uh, for 20 seconds, which for a meeting like that, summit conference, you know, closed confines for the leader of one of the two greatest economic powers in the world to take 20 seconds looking out the window, that's kind of a long time. And he turns around and says, well, it's okay. They were children and it was chemical weapons and we don't like that, so it's okay. But just think to yourself, what would be going through your head if you were Xi Jinping? what you had heard 10 or 15 minutes earlier. Oh, it's okay, if you don't want to help me, I'll do it myself. Well, had President Trump just proved that he's willing to do it himself? Yeah, he kind of did. Uh, and that yeah. took a lot of flair, that was a lot of guts ball. Uh, but I can remember watching some of the Republican debates early on when, when uh, the Bush candidacy, Jeff, Jeff's candidacy was sinking. And I won't say that candidate Trump was an eagle among chickens, but I, I do remember saying he's got the most energy of anybody up there on the stage, and he's kind of the best of them, even though I've known him negatively in the business world in, in New York. So, you know, he's a very mixed bag. I have huge fear of author, authoritarianism coming to America through <coughs> President Trump. Uh, I was in the Justice Department for a long time, uh, there is a very perceptible assault on the rule of law uh, in, in the Justice Department in this uh, administration. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see where all, that, where all that goes. But he certainly taught us that uh, the country was split uh, until he came along and, gave, and it was not readily visible until he came along and gave voice to uh, one of the two sides uh, of that split. So I think he's taught us a lot, uh, and I think we're going to learn more about uh, ourselves uh, as we go along. I, I think he may have taught us that democracy is fragile, which we haven't focused on uh, before before this this presidency. Do we have some questions from the audience for Bill Wealth? And if we have time, two, minutes. Two, two minutes for questions. Go. Uh, one of the things to follow up on what you just said, there's been a lot of talk about Donald Trump and the idea of unitary executive power, that the executive branch is actually in charge of the Justice Department. And I wonder, as former U.S. Attorney General, if you, or U.S. Attorney, if you could speak to that. Well, I remember when I served in the Reagan administration, um, and Ed Meese was the Attorney General, and Bill Webster, Judge Webster, was the head of the FBI. And the FBI was somewhat under assault from the top of the Justice Department to do things for political reasons. And I had uh, spent five years as U.S. Attorney in Boston doing my utmost to keep politics out of law enforcement. When you get politics into law enforcement, that's a very dangerous uh, situation, meaning partisan politics. And the Attorney General at one point had turned to me and said, can't you slow down on this guy? He's, uh, he's a friend of the President. Well, if someone had said that to me back in Boston, I would have opened an obstruction of justice uh, in, in investigation. So I, I believe in Judge Webster's uh, idea of watertight compartments. If you give our Constitution a careful reading, you're going to find all kinds of watertight compartments. You're going to find that those folks did not want a pure democracy. They wanted checks. They wanted balances. Uh, and it wasn't that they wanted to set one group against each other. They wanted structural checks and balances to prevent uh, a bad man from carrying an idea through to fruition in Washington. So people complain about the inefficiency of the government in Washington, uh, not so much me all the time, because it, if it prevents the bad, it's kind of like you'd rather, uh, you know, 10 guilty go free than that one uh, innocent person be convicted. Uh, you, you'd rather that things get stymied 
ten times in washington d c. rather than one person can carry the football all the way down the field and score in a bad cause. time for one more? one more. trump's deregulatory efforts and uh, judicial appointments particularly epa well i i know i'm supposed to say it's horrible uh i i, I guess it's horrible but it gets mixed up with uh, pruitt and the ethical uh, ethical challenges. And I'm a strong environmentalist. Uh, I, I do think that uh, some of the stuff they're trying to roll back, they're, they're not they're not off base on, on all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm not as horrified as some. I'm probably more knowledgeable about the, the, the environmental regs than, than, than some might be. Uh, so that's a mixed bag, and, and I think Pruitt the man and Pruitt the agenda have gotten kind of mixed up in, in, the, in the public mind. All right, round of applause, please. For Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube, and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.